uh, our next session is uh, controversies in PCI. The uh, respected chairperson, sir, Dr. Shailana, sir, please come. Uh, Professor M. Uh, Muklesur Hawk, Brigadier General, uh, Professor uh, Saida Alaya Sultana, Professor Amal Kumar Choudhury, Professor Arun Maske. And moderators are Professor Ashok Kumar Dotto, uh, Dr. Shaila Nasrin, and panelists are uh, Professor M. Uh, Siddiqur Rahman, Professor M. Tohidu Jaman, Professor Arun Kumar Sharma, and Dr. Uh, Muhammad Mahabul Mansur. Uh, I requested the uh, chairpersons, moderator, and panelists to take their seat. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. I am Dr. Shahnan Asrin, Associate Professor and Consultant from Ibrahim Cardiac Hospital and Research Institute, welcoming you all to Session 60, Controversy in PCI. Our Chairperson is Professor M. Maksumul Haq, Brigadier General Professor Saida Aliya Sultana, Professor Amor Kumar Choudhury, Professor Arun Maski from Nepal, and our panelists are Professor M. Siddiqur Rahman, Dr. M. Tahidu Zaman, Dr. Arun Kumar Sharma, Dr. M. Mahbub Mansur. You are all requested to have your seat on dais. Now may I request Professor Bernardo Cortesi. Thank you for your kind invitation uh, also to Professor Azam who invited me to be here and to talk about DCB, which is my main scientific and technical uh, point of interest. If you can upload the slide, yeah. Um, so, I, want, I would like to start from uh, uh, a quite clear concept, which is that the stents that we are using in our patients are not perfect, okay? This is the very long 10-year follow-up of patients treated in simple lesions or normal lesions, not complex lesions with two uh, widely used one widely used DES and another one experimental, but there is no difference. So we have a 3.3 percent of acute events every year with that device after the first year. So when we implant a stent, we have adverse events which will go on for our patients. The other concept that I would like to start with is that uh, when we implant a drug eluting stent, actually we implant a drug eluting stent for one year because in terms of event, after one year, it is quite the same as a bare metal stand. So the concept is that after one year, metal is metal. And then if we go deeper into more complex lesion settings, in this case, I'm showing you the small vessel disease, which is quite normal and typical here in Bangladesh, like in Pakistan, in India, and in many other countries, we can see that the adverse events, in this case with Zions, are double than in, in case of larger vessels. So in the complex setting, drug eluting stent is not so perfect or very well performing as we are expecting. And then on top of the complex uh, lesions, we also have complex patients like the one that we have seen now with the live case. We have a lot of patients with a history of bleeding, valvulopathy and then patients with reduced ejection fraction. So this is the setting where we are treating patients, okay? And we have to remind this. And then if we have patients with multivessel disease, uh, uh, we put a stent and then another one, and in the end we will have this thing with a chemin de fer, as we call it, with all of this metal which is uh, uh, percoring uh, the, the patient's uh, anatomy. If we use DCB, we may use a technology which better respects the anatomy of the vessel. We don't implant a scaffold unless we need it, but uh, I will show you some cases where we don't need it, and there is a possibility of the flattening of the curve of the of adverse events, because not implanting a, a stent, not implanting a scaffold, the adverse events will go down. This has been shown in several studies. Whereas if we implant metal, we strengthen the vessel, we may occlude side branch, and we put something that will never leave the patient. I'll be very fast for instant restenosis, okay? This is not my setting. Instant restenosis has a clear indication for the use of DCB as for the use of drug eluting stent in Europe. It's a class one level of evidence A, okay? 
this is okay. My focus here is to tell you which is our experience on the use of drug coated balloons in native vessel disease. And I'm going to show you one case, case that we did a few months ago with a diffuse disease, a highly calcific lesion in a proximal LAD, and then a total occlusion distally, diffuse disease. Uh, we hope that the proximal lesion of the LED was not significant, but we did uh, uh, IFR, which was 0.82, so we had to treat it. But uh, when we have calcium, we need to understand how is calcium. So in this specific case, we decided to do uh, the OCT. OCT imaging showed a calcific nodule. So we decided to use IVL. Well, yes, this is a very expensive case, but the patient was young and it deserved this. IVL was not able to cross the lesion, okay? So if you would have put a stent there without understanding by physiology and then imaging how was that lesion, in this case, we could have created big damage for the patient. So we predilated the lesion, we did rota, 1.5 bore, and then we predilated again, and then in the end, we did intravascular lithotripsy. In order to achieve a very good uh, preparation of the lesion. This is very important if we want to use drug coated balloons. This is very important if we want to use drug gluten stent as well, obviously. So when we have prepared the lesion, we decide to put the final therapy, which is DCBs in the proximal LED, in the mid LED, and distally where we had the, the, that occlusion. And we use 3O balloon, 3O balloon, and 2O balloon by 20 in the distal part. So this is sort of full DCB PCI of the left system. We don't have a stent-like result, but we don't need a stent-like result, okay? We don't have a scaffold. We don't have to feed our eyes when we have done a DCB PCI. Because we have clinical data that I'm going to show you very soon, showing that if the result is like this, the patient will not come back. And this is another case of a patient done uh, a few years ago with a total occlusion of the mid LED. After this very large diagonal branch, we prepared the lesion. This was not a complex uh, chronic total occlusion. So we prepared quite easily the lesion. Then we used a long drug coated balloon, 2.5 by 40. This was the final result. You can clearly see that the final result is not a stent-like result, okay? But as I said before, we don't need it because with some good drug-coated balloons, we may have a lumen enlargement after a few months, months from the implantation. And this is what happened in this patient after six months. We had this very nice result with a lumen gain and with a late loss, which was negative, okay? So the vessel was larger as the one that we left. This is something that is not happening when we use a drug eluting stent. We also did in this case the OCT just to show the uh, total healing of the dissection that we had left. Because this has been shown with paclitaxel coated balloon quite clearly that if we use a good paclitaxel coated balloons and we have some preliminary data also for sirolimus coated balloons, in the vast majority of the patient, the vessel will go increasing. And this has been shown by the German group and by our group as well. The other thing from this, ah, over there. The other thing from this Japanese study is showing that the dissection index is correlated positively with the lumen enlargement, which means that if you leave a dissection which is not flow limiting, if you leave a type A or type B dissection, that vessel is going to increase more in the dimension in, instead of the cases where you don't leave a dissection after DCB angioplasty. And we have so shown in this study, which was published seven years ago, that if we leave a dissection, the vast majority of the dissection are healing. In this case, we had three cases of dissection not healed, 45 cases of healed dissections, and most important, no thrombotic case because the message is that any type of drug-coated balloon is safe. It may go with restenosis, like with, with drug eluting stents, but it will never give you problems in terms of thrombotic events. And this is another case of another device that we used, uh, which is the Elotax uh, drug-coated balloons, which is showing a very good late lumen loss, 0.04, in a small vessel disease setting. In Piccoletto 2, we had all patients with up to 
2.75 millimeters of vessel diameters. And in this study, the Drakkotel balloon did outperform Zions. So we expected non inferiority, but we had superiority versus Zions. And this is quite the same with this other balloon, which is showing not differences as compared to drug eluting stent in native vessel disease between 2.0 and 3 millimeters in this randomized clinical trial. And then we have the most modern technology with drug coated balloons. I was mentioning it before during the live case. This is Magic Touch. Magic Touch is a Sirolimus coated balloon, the first one being marketed in Europe. And uh, in this device, we have Sirolimus, which is uh, protected by a, a, um, a phospholipid bilayer, which is creating these nanospheres, which are put upon the inflation of the balloon into the vessel wall. And what is happening is that, like for other devices, this sirolimus is entering the vessel wall and is staying there for the following weeks, exerting its effects. We have shown a very good late lumen loss in a native case series of patients, native vessel disease, small vessel disease up to 3.0, with a late lumen loss of 0.09, which is best, better than any other type of drug eluting stent in this lesion setting and vessel dimensions. After this, we decided to do a larger study and we designed the ISPON registry whose uh, results have been presented during EuroPCR one month ago. And this is the largest study ever done with Dracote Balloon. We enrolled prospectively 2,123 patients. Uh, I want to tell you that this study is an uh, investigator-driven study. And uh, we enroll patients from Europe, but also from a lot of uh, Asiatic countries with good experience with drug water balloons. And this is the clinical follow-up in this uh, all-camer population of patients uh, with instant restenosis, uh, native vessel disease, small vessels, also large vessels. The TLR rate is 6% after one year, all-camer population, 45% of patients with ACS. So TLR is 6%, MACE 9.2%, but you can see that the adverse events in terms of safety, which are total death and MI, are very low after one year. And interesting, the, ex the efficacy of Magic Touch is more pronounced in the native vessel disease setting. Because if we split instant restenosis versus native vessel disease, we can see that the TLR in the native vessel disease setting is very, very low. 2.5% after one year with all of the events in this study which have been adjudicated by a CEC. And these are the main determinants of TLR after 12 months, which are, as you can see, previous PCI and ISR on top of diabetes. Okay, so if we treat ISR, uh, DCB is less performing than if we treat with DCB native vessel disease. Okay. This is related to the fact that, as we know, TLR is something which is related to the, probably the first implantation of the stent, which is not perfect. So if we don't understand exactly which is the cause for TLR, and if we don't do intravascular imaging, also all of the other therapies that we are giving to the patient, DCB or drug eluting stent, may fail. So we have to keep this in mind. If we prepare perfectly the lesion uh, after ISR according to the findings of the intravascular imaging, the goal is done because also there the events will be lower. And we will go analyzing this specific subgroup of patients in future publications of the ISPON registry. Which, is, which are the new limits? The new limits are the very complex patients where we don't have to forget about the efficacy of drug eluting stents. So in these patients, we, sh we have to decide to use, to prepare all of the lesion, to use drug coated balloons for mid and distal vessels and to use drug eluting stents for the proximal vessels. This is the way to go in the complex patients. First thing. Second thing in the future is Transform 2. Transform 2 is another investigator driven study that, that we are running and we are enrolling patients comparing Magic Touch versus Zions in native vessel disease. So not only small vessel disease, but native vessel disease between 2.0 and 3 millimeters. So after we have prepared correctly the lesion, which is a mantra, it is so important we will randomize patients to these two strategies and we will see 
in 1,400 patients, so the largest randomized clinical trial on DCB, if there will be no differences in terms of TLF. We hypothesized non-inferiority for TLF, and we hypothesized the superiority for NACE, because as you know, with Dracotel balloon, we may reduce the total length of uh, antiplatelet therapy as compared to drug eluting stent. So this is the uh, investigator steering committee that I'm coordinating for transfer two. And I'm going to show you to finish the last minute with this case, which is another complex case of an 84 year old lady with reduced ejection fraction, which came with ACS and heart failure at our hospital. So we stabilized the patient due to the heart failure and then we brought her to the cath lab. This is what we found, the CTO of the RCA and the very diffusely disease of the LAD. In this patient with a history of bleeding in a gastrointestinal, gastroenteric part, we decided to use a full DCB strategy also here this is the cert that we decided to leave alone, and this is the spider view to see how aggressive was this. This is, I think, a, a typical Bangladesh patient, uh, how aggressive is the atherosclerosis. So we decided to go for a, a full vascularization with DCB. We prepare all of the lesions with non-compliant or semi-compliant balloon. We also use one scoring balloon, and then we started using DCB for the diagonal branch for the proximal LED and the other diagonal branch, and then for the mid LED. This is the final result, and this is the final result from the cranial view, which is a nice result. We don't need the stents here. And then, a few days later, we decided also to attempt the CTO. We prepared the lesion, and then full DCB with magic touch. Three magic touch, and this is the final result with a good dissection, but we have learned that a good dissection is good for DCB because it will let the drug enter into the vessel wall. So if it's not flow limiting, you can stop. So my conclusions, current era drug routine stent are good, but they are not perfect, especially on the long term of our patients. DCB and specifically Sirolimus Magic Touch DCB are a valid alternative to drug eluting stent in some native vessel disease anatomical settings. So before paving the coronary arteries of your patient, just think at this possibility. In some specific settings, with the complex lesion settings, you may also decide to go for a hybrid approach with full DCB and then spot stenting. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bernardo. Thank you. I think uh, uh, the, uh, there is four lectures. Each lecture is different topics. So we can discuss three minutes for after each presentation. So okay. any, anybody can ask any question. Um, you so can ask all the, the topics person. in this oh, session oh, are different. So uh, we have got two to three minutes per question. Any question so from the any, audience, can please? Can I ask a question? Uh, yes. I, I have a question to you. Uh, in uh, DCB, how, uh, how they, uh, when I deal a long lesion, it is about 30, 40 millimeter. The, the, what is the highest size of DCB and highest dia? What is the highest size? Length, longest length longest of length. side of yeah. the DCB. Yeah. Well, it depends on the brand. Uh, Very uh, objective question. It's 40. Uh, yeah. 40. We have 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40 you have 40 in have. different dia. Dia diameter uh, and usually range and, between. Uh, one. And to complete drug e evaluation, how long it's to be need to be evaluated, need to be uh, inflated. Yeah. This is very important. Uh, uh, usually, we, we, have, we suggest a minimum of 30 seconds because in the animal data, we have seen that after 30 seconds, you will deliver the vast majority of the drug, what you need. But if you are dealing with a very complex lesions, uh, uh, with long lesions, calcific lesions, my suggestion is to go on for one minute and even more if the patient does tolerate it. But so you inflate it slowly, you reach your goal in terms of uh, atmospheres, and you keep it uh, for a minimum of one minute. Okay. But in my small experience, uh, a patient cannot tolerate uh, above 30 minutes. If 30 it seconds. is 30 seconds, yeah. if it is not, not, not viable, all the uh, ETT positive or connectable angina, not MI related. MI related can tolerate more time. 
but it is not related to MI or no, uh, STEMI, non STEMI. Patient cannot tolerate even, even then uh, about uh, 30 seconds. Yeah, I think the this, complaint, is a, the CPR this is a good point. Particularly in LAD territory. Yes. This and is a good point. Also in ISR. Also but in ISR. You can anticipate this because uh, when you use a drug coated balloon. Can we deflate and again inflate it? Eh? Can we deflate for some second and de no. inflate it? No, 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 it's not enough. Uh, uh, you, you can anticipate this because you always have to prepare the lesion. And so you see, if the patient after five seconds uh, has pain, you may decide or to convert it to the drug looting stent or to give him some morphine. Yeah. yeah. At a minimum so, of 30 uh, seconds. Uh, Dr. Anis has got one question, please. Sir, uh, if your lesion is, say you said you have a 40 millimeter high size, say it is 50 millimeter is your, your diffuse disease. So can you uh, do uh, like... 40 is one balloon and another overlap with another uh, 10 size or 15 size balloon. Is it possible or? For sure. Yes. Because, um, you know, uh, differently from Paclitaxel, with Sirolimus we have a very large therapeutic window. So if we use even three or four, I've shown you the cases where I used uh, in two different uh, procedures, uh, six magic touch, uh, there is no issues in terms of uh, total amount of drug delivered to the patient. So it is common to use more than one drug-coated balloon yes. during a complex procedure. Yes. And Thank another you. is uh, when you use the ostium lesion, so you need to cover only ostium or you can go beyond so that you need to not make sure there's no miss of the ostium. This is a very important point. Uh, ostium lesions are difficult, okay, if we are not scaffolding them. And then we have learned in the last few years to use the scoring balloons because if we create the crack, with the scoring balloon, it is easier to deploy the drug coated balloon and not to have a recoil. Because uh, uh, I didn't have the time to tell this, but uh, when you go for a DCB PCI, you should check the final result of it after five, six, seven minutes. And if you don't have recoil, you stop it and you go away. In terms of the other part of the question, yes, you should size your balloon to the more distal part of the lesion in order not to have dissection distally. Dr. Bernardo, uh, how do you define the angiographic success after using a drug eluting balloon and how okay. long would you like to wait for a favorable remodeling of the artery uh, to, for, and do you recommend a routine check CAG after using a drug eluting balloon? At what interval? Uh, well, usually, we have seen these after three to four months with Paclitaxel, and uh, we have also uh, seen these with Sirolimus. In the native study that I showed in just one slide, uh, after six months, uh, we already got the, the final result. Uh, what type of uh, lesion is allowed? Well, in the consensus papers, we usually suggest uh, to, be, to have a maximum of 30% final stenosis. More than 30% uh, is not perfect, but since we are treating patients which are very complex, uh, also a, f a maximum of 50% final stenosis in the very complex setting is allowed after DCBPCI. So, uh, for the uh, sake of time, thank you, Dr. Thank Barnard, you, Dr. for Barnard. your nice Any lecture. Questions? If Sir. anyone has got any question, I personally... Question. Yes, Kaim. So, uh, this is the last question. Thank you yes. for an excellent case. Do you use any imaging uh, to see the final result like OCT or IVAS to detection the, any dissection, critical dissection? Also, this is a great point. Uh, I was suggesting not to use uh, IVAS there during the live case because uh, if you are not very experienced with DCB, you may be so seeing with OCT th those large dissections forced to use uh, a drug looting stent. So in our experience, uh, angiography is enough as a final result. I repeat, type A or type B dissection, not flow limiting, is perfect. More than type B, I suggest to put a, a short stance. Do you uh, have any experience about acute closure? No. 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 Thank Thank you. I only Thank had you, one case out of thousands of patients treated by DCB. Uh, it was my mistake uh, 10 years ago because I only did a final view, not in the orthogonal view after five minutes because uh, I was hurrying. And then patient came back with chest pain and had an occlusion of the vessel. But uh, if I, I review the case, and there was a dissection which was almost closing the vessel. So only one case out of thousands, but which was not managed carefully.
Thank you. Thank you. Well. Thank you, Dr. Bernard. So our next speaker is Professor D.S. Gambhir. Uh, his topic is, is IVL the replacement for rota in calcified and diffuse coronary artery disease? Uh, Dr. D.S. Gambhir, he is the group director and specialist in complex multivessel PCI, group director, Kailash Hospital, Noida. He is also Padhusri Audi. His speech on IVL replacement for rota in calcified diffuse coronary artery disease. Uh, friends, for the past uh, two days in this meeting, uh, we have been trying to uh, crack the calcium in the coronary arteries. And as you know, there are several tools which are available now to uh, treat the calcification in the coronaries. And amongst these tools, IVL has emerged as one of the important uh, competitors. So, uh, since it is easy to use, since uh, the results are, I would say, reasonably predictable. Uh, there is a, a big jump in the use of IVL. Uh, so that brings a, a very important question Recording to me. Recording in progress. A, a very important question for me in my mind is that can IVL be a replacement for root ablation in these severely calcified and diffusely diseased coronary arteries? Well, uh, you all have seen that uh, calcification of the coronary artery is uh, one of the biggest enemies for the implantation of the stents because it leads to inadequate uh, delivery of the stents, inadequate expansion of the stents and also uh, promotes uh, late uh, high incidence of late stent thrombosis. Uh, several tools are available and amongst these uh, the two which are uh, most popular and are uh, very useful are uh, rotational etherectomy and uh, of course cutting balloon not uh, as effective as uh, rotational etherectomy for uh, calcific coronary artery disease particularly diffuse disease but of late we have now got the shock wave or the uh, intravascular lithotrepsy. Now uh, there is no doubt that uh, uh, lithotrepsy has certain advantages which we have all seen over the past few years ever since it has been introduced. Uh, it is a balloon based therapies and the shockwave IVL system is easy to learn compared to uh, the other forms of therapy particularly root ablation. But what I am going to show you is some of the limitations of IVL and then some situations or a lot of situations where uh, IVL would not have worked. Let me go a little bit fast here. Uh, first thing is IVL can only be used in lesions which are, which are un uh, which are uncrossable with balloon, can't be used in un lesions which are uncrossable with balloon. So you have to first cross the lesion and uh, then the IVL balloon would go, otherwise it generally does not go. It's a difficult device uh, to deliver because of bulky nature of the IVL balloon and uh, is generally recommended for deep calcification. But many of the patients have got only a superficial calcification and may not be required. And lastly, high cost as compared to even root ablation. Now let us look at uh, some of the studies conducted with the IVL. Uh, if you look at DISRUPT3 trial which included 431 patients, uh, crossing failure with IVL balloon was encountered in 2% of the patients. And uh, in 17% of the patients, they had to use a guide extension to get uh, the IVL balloon across the stenosis. And a body wire was used in almost about 3% of the patients. So overall you can see that uh, almost about 15 to 20 percent of the patients you would not be able to place the IVL balloon directly into the target site. Then adjunctive devices, for example balloon dilatation is required before you can put an IVL balloon in almost half of the cases. Otherwise the balloon of IVL would not be able to reach at the target site. And rota ablation was required in this uh, study in almost 5 percent of the patients. Then comes the uh, procedural uh, portions of this study. IVL catheter per patient required was 1.2 which adds to the cost. And uh, the outcome in disrupt 3 trial, maze at 30 days was 7.8 percent. It's not a small maze at 30 days. And deaths occurred of course in 0.5 percent of patients. And serious angiographic complications in almost about 2.5 percent of patients. 
so it is a procedure which is not totally safe it has got its own inherent limitations it has got its own complications now i'll show you some cases where you would be alarmed that can we use ivl in such cases let me first define what is a diffuse uh, coronary artery disease what is a tortuosity what is calcification now you can see an example here this is a diffuse coronary artery disease which is highly calcified now if you go to the literature there is no set definition given by any of the uh, societies what is a diffuse coronary artery disease but what i feel is that anything which is uh, longer than 25 mm in length i call it as, as a diffuse coronary artery disease and tortuosity when there are multiple bends before within or after the disease segments it's a it's a, it's a tortuous coronary artery and calcification as you know can be classified as mild moderate or severe even on fluoroscopy so this is a one of the patients which has got a high grade uh, calcific stenosis which is uh, in a diffuse disease uh, arteries now uh, in my experience i have done almost about more than 1500 rotas and uh, diffuse disease arteries have been done in 39 patient with a success rate of 100% and we had only one uh, death this was because of slow flow now i'll show you one of these cases and this is the case which i just now showed uh, this is you can see a very high grade stenosis in the left main distal uh, the led is highly tortuous calcified with lot of bends circumflex obtuse marginal all are disease and uh, this patient had carcinoma of the glottis uh, the surgeons had refused surgery on him he presented to us with acute left ventricular failure we treated his failure stabilized him and this was the angiogram after 4 days now can you use uh, devices like ivl or any other devices that i have listed here to treat these coronaries certainly no so we embarked upon rotor ablation with some fear in our mind of slow flow so we used the step bar approach of 1.25 followed by 1.5 mm bar and following this we put to uh, long stents 38 mm distally in the led and then we did a left main uh, bifurcation angioplasty using a uh, mini crush technique on one hand we had a led stent and the other is the lc stent and a mini crush technique was used and this is the final result after putting in 4 des so very gratifying result and it was impossible to achieve this result with ivl now this is a second patient 87 years old lady and you see the right coronary artery now this is a shepherd crook right coronary artery with multiple bends highly tortuous vessel very old lady diabetic and you see a distal rca bifurcation stenosis so again uh, right from the beginning we took a amplas guiding catheter uh, threaded the vessel with a rota wire and uh, straight away went with the rota using a 1.25 mm bar and uh, after that we started deploying the stents uh, after post post uh, rota balloon dilatation and uh, we deployed four stents uh, first distal into the plv and uh, distal rca then into the mid rca and then the third stent was deployed uh, into the pd using a tap technique and finally a stent at the proximal osteoproximal part of the right coronary artery and this was the final result now again these kind of cases cannot be done with the ivl the third patient is again a, a patient who had a significant diffuse disease uh, high grade stenotic lesions in the led which is highly calcified so uh, this was the ivs uh, which we did and you can see that there are areas where there is a 360 degree calcification with the thick layer of calcium both superficial and deep and uh, so we uh, had to resort to rota in this patient 1.25 followed by 1.5 mm bar and uh, after rota ablation and uh, putting in uh, three stents in the led this was the result uh, excellent uh, result which again is not possible with devices like ivl uh, the next is a 78 years gentleman who is having a chronic kidney disease he is on uh he was on dialysis and uh, uh ejection fraction of 40% and you see here this is a pre uh, coronary angio uh, pre pci angiogram you can see that again a very thin uh, diffuse disease led it's not a very large size vessel uh the vessel is uh, heavily calcified with areas of high grade stenosis in between lcx is also uh, highly calcified with uh, moderate degree of stenosis 
So uh, we uh, first did a IVUS of the LED in this patient and you can see that there are 360 degree rims of calcium in the proximal LED, mid LED. So how far you can keep on putting IVL balloon? This balloons would not even go. So uh, we embarked upon rota and this is a rota using a 1.5 meter burst straight away. And following this rota and uh, this was the result after putting in two long DES 38, 38 into the LED. Thereafter, we went into the uh, circumflex and the same bar 1.5 meter. We rotated into the circumflex. There was a very, uh, there was a quite a bit of difficulty in crossing the high grade snow in the circumflex. You can see here, the bar is getting stuck over there. Finally, we were able to get this bar across this, and uh, we uh, removed the calcium. Uh, prepared the bed for uh, the implantation of a long stent. So we had to implant two stents, uh, 2.75 into 48 uh, uh, from ostium to proximal part and then distally another 14 millimeter stent. And so this is the final result in both the vessels. So uh, lastly, uh, this is another case. Uh, now all these cases I'm trying to show you and convince you that uh, the uh, technology of rota is the only technology which would have worked in these cases. Where is this gone? Can you come? Where is the? Can you come here? Uh, I can't see the. Cursor. Cursor has got displayed somewhere. Yeah. No, remove the remove the other one also. Yeah, so this is a uh, pre-PCI angiogram, again the similar kind of LED and a RCA, again uh, diffuse disease. And uh, this patient had a uh, diagonal uh, which was seen in the previous angiogram and the LED was in fact a CTO. So we cross the CTO and then you see that uh, the kind of vessel that we found after crossing the CTO diffuse the disease vessel right from uh, proximal part to mid part and distal part. So this is after doing balloon dilatation of the LED. And uh, we did a IVUS in this LED and we found again uh, severe calcification. And then we did rota using step bar technique 1.25 followed by 1.5 millimeter bar. And then after putting in uh, uh, two or three stents, you can see that uh, the proximal to mid part of the LED looks excellent. Now, this is a RCA of a patient uh, which was a challenge for me, a case which I did live in one of the meetings outside uh, India. Uh, you can see here that the right coronary artery has got a high grade stenosis, both proximal going up to the mid and then the stenosis in the distal part. And uh, even the rota bar would not go. We used a Judkins guiding catheter. Firstly, the wire was difficult to get into the, uh, across the stenosis, but with the slow speed rotation, we could advance the wire gradually and uh, then the next problem was that uh, we were unable to cross this stenotic lesion with bar of 1.25 millimeter. So at uh, that time we got frustrated, we used the amplage guiding catheter but you can see that there was a bend in the amplage guiding catheter and uh, this bend would not allow the bar to go in. So I had to burr uh, at a very high speed to get across this bend and finally the bar went in and then it started burring the uh, lesion and we were able to get across. So we uh, did a rota of the uh, proximal to mid part of the RCA and uh, then deployed uh, stents. And after this we uh, in fact doing a rota of the proximal to mid part, we pulled out everything. We thought we will be able to do the distal part just with the balloon. But that was not to be so because balloon would not cross. So we had to go back to Judkins now and now we again had to rewire the with the, the rota wire and then did a rota into the distal part and deployed three long stents and this was the final result. So uh, friends in the last, uh, rota is the only modality which worked in such a calcified and diffuse coronary artery. But I think more important than that is rota works where IVL has failed and I'll show you a case where uh, even rota had failed, uh, rota had failed, then we use a IVL, even IVL failed and then we have to fall back onto rota and that worked. This is the case, I'll quickly run through it. A high grade synotic lesions in the proximal to mid to almost distal part of the LED with very tight synotic areas at two sides, proximal and at the point where the diagonal is coming. 
and see the IOC images, highly calcified rings of calcium with a calcium score of 3. We did a rota using a 1.5 mm bar uh, and following this you see that uh, uh, we inflated balloons, there were big waves particularly in the proximal part. So we then use a IVR balloon. The distal uh, uh, lesion opened up reasonably well but see the proximal lesion, you can still see a lot of waste on the proximal side. So uh, this is a post uh, IVL post balloon result. Uh, you can see the waste continues to remain particularly in the proximal lesion. So then uh, we use a high pressure balloon uh, in this case but even the high pressure balloon would not allow the waste to disappear. You can see it continues. So at that point of time we got frustrated. So we then use uh, upsize the bar from 1.75 to state of a 2 millimeter bar. And then we burned this with a 2 millimeter bar and following that we uh, then put a uh, high pressure balloon and with three wires in. Uh, you can see that there are two body wires we put a balloon and then uh, deployed a stent and this was the final result after deploying the stent. So friends in conclusion I would say that it's uh, feasible and safe to perform PCI in these highly calcified coronary arteries after adequate uh, plaque modification. IVL is although a easy to use technology but has several limitations particularly its inability to advance bulky balloon across tight snoses. IVL's guided imaging is of course useful and debulking using rotablation can be performed successfully even after failed IVL using appropriate size of the bar. Point that needs to be emphasized is that many of us are scared in upsizing our bar. We used to do uh, in the previous institution bars as big as 2.25 and even 2.5. But since they uh, stopped uh, supplying bars of two, uh, above 1.75, so in between we were not using those bars, but we have now got back with almost 2.15 and 2.25, so we upsize the bar. So what is the take home message? IVL is not an alternative to root ablation, particularly in diffusely diseased and calcified coronary arteries, but may be a companion to rota in deep calcification which are undilatable even with root ablation. With that, I thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Gambit, for your nice information about ROTA and IVL. Can we request our next speaker, Professor Farooq Ahmed. He is the Chief Cardiac Surgeon from National Heart Foundation Hospital and Research Institute. Please welcome Professor Farooq Ahmed. Respected chairpersons and the learned audience, Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. Is CFG really the best primary approach to multifacial left main disease, a surgeon's viewpoint? First, I'd like to mention it's a discussion, not drawing any conclusion. And at the beginning, I'd like to draw your attention to some facts and reviews. And this does the common regular disease is gradually increasing and every two seconds, someone aged 30 to 70 years dies present prematurely from NCDs and of the NCDs it is the ischemic heart disease which has remained the number one killer for the last 20 years. And interestingly coronary heart disease was initially thought to be disease of modern humans with the cause being attributed to contemporary lifestyles. However, the disease is not as new as we thought. An article in the Lancet in 2013 with CT scans of mummies from four different geographical regions shown that atherosclerosis may be very ancient. And with the surgery, death decline in cardiovascular disease with the advance of time and science. Like first open heart surgery was done in 1954 and in angiography in 1958, first reported CABG in 69 angioplasty in 1977 and in 1993 superiority of primary PCI versus fibrinolysis in acute MI was noted and in 2002 efficacy of drug eluting versus bare metal stents were determined. In 2009 left ventricular SS device as destination therapy in advanced heart failure shown to be effective. This is the global distribution of ischemic heart disease and the treatment option for ischemic heart disease are this medical management, PCI and CABG. CABG is arguably the most 
intensively studied surgical procedure. And PS PCI has been subjected to more randomized clinical trials than any other interventional procedure. Of the PCI, advantages are superior for acute cases, short hospitalization, early work resumption, less invasive and therefore suitable for some comorbidities. Limitation, mandates dual antiplatelet regimen, potentially incomplete revascularization, higher risk of need for repeat revascularization. And about CABG advantage, mortality benefit in diabetic patients with left multivessel multi disease, mortality benefit in complex multivessel disease, more complete revascularization, lower risk of recurrent angina. And limitations, more invasive, higher risk of stroke or neurological injury, longer hospitalization. Requirement for patent conduit, wait times may limit timely access in some institutions and healthcare settings. The different presentation of coronary disease, as we know, single vessel disease, my left main stem, multi vessel disease, complex, diffuse disease, like that. And initially, it, uh, the PCO has performed in only single vessel disease. And the rest of the things are taken care by COBG. But with the time, now PCI is being done in single vessel, multi vessel, left mind, acute MI. Except for this complex diffuse disease or sometimes diffuse disease, diabetes mellitus and comorbidities. Left mind and multi vessel disease. During taking decision about CBG versus PCI, three things we usually consider the symptomatic benefits like angina, repeat MI, hospitalization, and in our setting, cost is also important, and of course, the mortality benefit. Was a review of some literature. It's a landmark multiversal trials comparing outcome. The result was no survival benefit to CABG over PCI, except in patients with complex disease. Like synthesis score high and intermediate cases, CABG is better than PCI. And Landmark left main disease test comparing outcome. There are no survival benefit or to CBG over PCI. Though in significantly no difference, but there are some improved results in case of CBG. The one trial we very talked about is FAME 3 trial, whose hypothesis was in persons with CBSS coronary disease, FFR guided PCI with a, with a current generation DSA. Dagelodin stent is non inferior to CBG with respect to one year mace. Is the primary endpoint mace? It was better with the surgery. And secondary endpoints, it was almost similar, little improved in surgery, but it is the in case of surgery, the stroke rate was little high. And as I said, mentioned, MES according to Sintes score with intermediate uh, lowest Sintes scores, PCI is better. With intermediate and high score, surgery is better. FEM3 and Syntex trials, percentage of MES at one year. In both the cases, it is better with CBG. In patients with three vessel coronary disease, FFR guided PCI with the current generation DES did not meet the criteria set for non inferiority in comparison with CABG in terms of death, MI, stroke, or revascularization at one year. One year rate of death, MI, or stroke was significantly different between two groups. In frame three, MACE rates for both FFR guided PCI and CBG are lower than with CBG in syntax trial. FFR guided PCI with the current generation diagonal stand performed favorably in comparison with CABG in three vessels coronary disease patients with less complex disease according to syntax score. In patients with more complex three vessel coronary disease, CABG remains the treatment of choice. This is the guideline, you already know it. And this is 2021 SEC uh, gui revascularization guideline. Like in case of late main coronary disease, CABG is recommended to improve survival. And multivessel coronary disease, CABG may be reasonable to improve survival, but PCI to improve survival is uncertain. 
and revasculation in patients with stable ischemic heart disease and multivessel coronary disease appropriate for either CABG or PCI, revascularization is reasonable to lower the risk of cardiovascular events such as spontaneous MI, unplanned urgent, urgent revascularization or cardiac death. Why to prefer CBG? There are a few words about CBG. These days, we are doing, perform this beating heart or off-pump sur surgery. Keeping the heart beating during surgery has been shown to be safer alternative in reducing complications and mortality in patients with surgical risks. In off-pump in off -pump surgery, we can avoid the complications of on-pump or arrested heart surgeries. Benefits of Beating heart surgeries are less myocardial injury, shorter ICU stay times, and reduced hospital stay, reduced hospi uh, ICU stay, lower mortality in high risk patients, reduced blood loss and need for transfusion, lower rates of postoperative renal dysfunction and kidney failure. And this is where it has been said that on pump versus off pump, or off pump is no better, no inferior than to the on pump or arrested heart. And about the graft pregnancy, uh, there is the article which showed off-pump CBG is non-inferior to on-pump CBG in terms of overall graft patency and at three months and was associated with fewer combined cumulative mesh compared to on-pump CBG. This is a big list. I want to avoid it, skip it. Definitely CBG graft is a long-lasting repair. About the conduct in surgeries, in the, in the end of 10 years, the patency rate of internal memory is something between 85 and 90. And with the cephalus vein, at the end of 10 years, it was 50. But the, most of those data, 50% written in the book, were of older time. Recently, it has been shown that non tusk pedicle venous graft has patency rate is as good as in Lima. Like, Lima has a patency rate of 86% at the end of nine, 10 years, whereas Pedicle vein graft has pregnancy rate of 83%, almost same as that of Lima. And lastly, we have entered the region of era of minimal invasive surgery. In our country, it is being performed and with good results, no complications. And about the complications of revascularization. 10-year all-cause death according to completeness of revascularization patients with three vessel disease of length main coronary artery, which shows revascularization, complete revascularization is better with CABG than with PCI. Incomplete revascularization is common after PCI and the degree of incompleteness was associated with 10-year mortality. If it is unlikely that complete revascularization cannot be achieved with PCI in patients with three vessel disease, CBG should be considered. And of course, CBG is not the job done. It needs secondary prevention so that it doesn't come back. And about the CBG, about the cost effectiveness, yearly total costing or in, uh, from expenditure for the patient is a higher in the case of PCI than in CABG, it is shown in a study. And in our country, in Bangladesh, in government hospital, the cost of CABG in terms of dollar is about $800. In private partner, public, uh, non-profit, service oriented hospital, it is around $2,300. And in private hospital, it is something between $3,000 to $4,000. And of course, the CABG is safe and low mortality. The hospital wh where we work, uh, the, uh, from 2011 to 2021,20, including the corona period where less surgeries were performed, total performance of CABG was 12,635 and our mortality was 1%. So, in the conclusion about the decision of CABG, I prefer to have a hard team approach. Hard team approach gives the better result, better outcome for the patient and better outcome for the surgeons and cardiologists also. In conclusion, the field of coronary revascularization is complex and constantly evolving. To make the best decision for our patients, we need to consider guidelines, new data and technologies, and integrate those information into the care of individual patients according to their comorbidities. Lastly, I like to draw your attention about the guidelines. I think now it is the high time 
to make recommendations and guidelines for the, our patients in this region of the world because here large number of PCIs and surgeries are performed and the disease pattern and the type of vessels and the complications totally different that of Western world. What we say and what we follow all the time, go on following the AHA or European recommendations, guidelines, but probably the time has come to establish guidelines for ourselves also. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Parkamit, sir, for a nice deliberation uh, on CABG reality, and that is the best primary approach. So, any question from the audience, please? Can I, can I make a comment? Yes, sir. <coughs> well, uh, first of all, let me congratulate you uh, for very lucid presentation, highlighting uh, the both sides, CABG as well as uh, coronary intervention. But I think uh, one very important thing which you possibly did not uh, uh, put force into it was uh, the 10 years follow-up results which uh, are aimed only to find out all-cause mortality. Uh, this is a syntax trial, which is 10 years follow-up results only concentrating on all-cause mortality. All-cause mortality. And CABG versus PCI, there was no statistically significant difference. And this I am highlighting because uh, when five years results were available, the surgeons would say, oh, you have only five years follow-up results, we have 20 years results. Now we have say, we can say that we have 10 years results and there is no difference in all-cause mortality. After all, we are all working to live. Yeah. So, uh, safety is one part of it and then survival. Survival, there is no difference, that's one point. Number two, uh, pre-combat trial has shown also 10 years follow-up results of left main. And they said that in diabetics and non-diabetics, both CABG versus PCI, there is no difference. difference. So therefore, uh, one need not be scared that in diabetics you have got a high maze rate and high, uh, you know, mortality. That's not true in pre-combat trial. That's also 10 years of follow-up. Third thing is re re completeness of revascularization. Uh, of course, this is an old study which I am going to quote. Uh, several years ago, when we were studying DM in cardiology, there was a paper which came. Ten percent of the uh, surg ten percent of the grafts, uh, disease vessels, were even not grafted by the surgeons because they could not identify. Because we have shown them an angiogram, they could not find the obtuse marginal branch. And ten percent they grafted on a normal vessel, wrong vessel, a vessel which needed to be grafted was not grafted, whereas a graft was put on a normal vessel. So, this is a paper which published, which was published. So, uh, yes, I agree that uh, interventionists are not able to do a complete revascularization. But whether you do a complete or incomplete 10 years, survival is same. same. So, uh, I think we must admit to that fact and uh, be less invasive and uh, go home after three days and enjoy life. Yeah, I do agree. Go home after faster three days. But you know, on the table at times, as you said, we, at times we see there vessel. on the angiogram we can see there is a bare area but no vessel. But on the table we can see some vessel is there and graftable vessel. So we put a graft there. That leads to some, uh, I mean, some amount of completeness, number one. Number two, well, the, what you see on the angiograms, these are the luminogram. Uh, if you see the vessel on the tab table, at times you will feel like runaway. The vessels are so calcified or so thick or atherosclerotic, cheesy, various diff different types. So we have to find out a good healthy area to put the graft so that graft remains patent. And as you know, according to the Western recommendation, small vessel grafts get closed earlier. Their level of small vessel is less than 2 millimeter. We used to say 1 millimeter, now says 2 millimeter. And on the table, and if you can see on the angiogram, we rarely get two millimeter vessels. In this subcontinent, the vessels are most of the vessels are around 1.752. More than two millimeter vessels are very rare in this subcontinent. So that's why our surgery and result is somewhat different from them, but still it is better, I must say. And that's why I said that we should have our I mean, recommendations and registers. registers. Yes, and yes. lastly, my friends are here, they are they know 
at times they are annoyed with me, they send the patient for surgery, I send the ba patients back to them because the patient's <laughs> faces are <laughs> awful, the ejection pressure is low, patient is not doing well, I cannot put too much graft. So I said, okay, may put the patient on maximum med medical management to put one, two grafts to increase the blood flow and the patient will be benefited. And in indirectly, quite a number of times I talk to my colleagues and my cardiologist friends to have a better decision about the treatment of the patient. I think that's a, a pure honesty and I think I must compliment that, that uh, a surgeon is accepting that many of the vessels are not graftable when we send it to yeah. them and they send it back to cardiologists. I think that's a, a real honest work that you're doing and I think that needs to be applause. And thank you very much. Yes, thank yes. You. Uh, and the thing I, I like to say, uh, he's one of the uh, surgeon, highest number of surgery he's doing in our country. And he's the most cardiologist friendly. Uh, um. Thank you. Dr. Also, actually, I'm not good enough, happy for his award because he is more ethical. It is not cardiologist friendly. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Sir, 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 I one, one, question, one question, sir. Sir, off-pump CABG is an uh, attractive alternative, but uh, when our patients coming from abroad, from Western country, they mostly use on-pump CABG. Is there any cause that they are preferring on-pump and uh, we are preferring the off-pump CABG? And one of my queries is there may be a chance of uh, less revascularization uh, in off-pump CAVG, is, is it true? No, it is not true. We put as much as 5 six grafts. That doesn't cause pro problem, we can put it. And Western world, they want to take the, I mean, they want to go through this chain, put, they want to have a good, happy life, patient, the heart is arrested, put the graft and come back. But during off-pump, it is the whole time the surgeon and the whole team stands to maintain the output, maintain the pressure, rhythm, and at the same time, proper grafting. So this is, this reduces the life expectancy of the surgeons. But at the same time, it can be done, patients go home early and less costly, economic. This is the reason we go for off-pump. Uh, actually, we are always making debate on PCI or CAVG better, which one is better. Um, now, I, um, I changed my mind, we should make debate on whether the good for intervention cardiologist or the surgeons. Do you agree with me or not? No, I, as, as I told you, that I prefer heart team approach. Not only surgeon and cardiologist, we should yeah. include the intensivist and anesthetist also in the team, so that we can jointly take the decision which, is, which part or what is to be done for, for the betterment of the patient. Sir, conceptually it is very great idea, but sometimes our heart team, team can't make decision actually what should do for our the patient, which one is the best for our patient. So in that particular situation, on how I recommend my patient, look, our heart team approach not able to conclude a single decision, which one is best for you. So if like me, if it is my father or mother, then I have like to take the decision like that way. Exactly. Yes. Yes. So in that uh, case, can sir, I, you can, can, you can refer the patient to general cardiologist for uh, guideline directed medical therapy. Yeah. Now so I, uh, we are I, running uh, short of time, so our next one, speaker. One, one, one comment only. Yes, I, I, yes. I, I, yeah. uh, thank you very much. It was excellent presentation. I've seen you for a long time. I've seen you in, in your infancy and now <laughs> I can see you as a mature <laughs> surgeon. And uh, congratulations on uh, what you said. Thank you. But um, uh, one thing I want to say that, you know, the whole purpose of having heart team is that it is for both sides. Yeah. For medical side as a surgeon and medicine plus the patient side is there. Because, you know, if, if it is your relative, as uh, Professor Azam was saying, that, you know, this is the whole purpose of heart team is to, uh, uh, it's a triangle for, with the physician, with the surgeons, with the anesthesiologists and the, uh, you know, the outcome of it we discussed, uh, along with patient and relative. We shouldn't forget that this is the whole purpose of it to make it smooth. 
and whatever is the outcome, we should discuss frankly 30%, 40%, 2%, 1%, yes, whatever that is, it is. That is very and important. that this is the purpose of her team. And mm. most of the countries now, they prefer it because of, you know, this debate goes on, intervention versus surgery, and this is good, this is where, those you can make you understand that way. It is yeah. easier in, your, in our country than other countries where it is very difficult, so, and you are countable there. Yeah. So, the insurance is there. So, there you are countable, and her team has got a real good value, and they do dis uh, discuss, and they, they really respect the opinion. Yeah. I think your approach, what you said, I, as I said, I congratulate you, and you. I think this should be in everywhere. And Thank I you. wish you good luck for that. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Professor Parakamath, for nice deliberation. Our next speaker is Professor Fajilat Nisam Ali. Uh, he is the chief and uh, director, uh, course director, National Heart Foundation Hospital and uh, Research Institute. And she will be talking on calcified instant stenosis, how to treat. Very difficult uh, thing to treat. Uh, how to treat calcified ISR. Friends and colleagues, it's indeed a great honor and privilege for me to be here today. And today I will be talking about calcified instant restenosis. Now we all know that uh, instant restenosis is an angiographically defined entity and we all are familiar with the Mehran classification of instant restenosis which is basically anatomically driven. So why does a person have instant restenosis? Obviously, there are certain responsible factors. Number one, it could be patient-related, and we all are aware that diabetic patients are notorious for suffering from instant restenosis. It could be lesion-related. We do know that certain lesions are more prone to instant restenosis when we stent them, like complex bifurcation lesions, then long lesions, uh, which has already been alluded to, and multivessel disease. Procedure related, if we leave a stent fracture, a uh, dissection, an underexpanded stent, all of this in the future could lead to instant restenosis. And in fact, Instant restenosis has been reclassified recently according uh, to the disease mechanism, and we know that it could be the underlying cause could be mechanical, like stent fracture, strut fracture, or under expansion of the stent, or it could be biological reasons like new intimal hyperplasia, new atherosclerosis without calcification or new atherosclerosis with calcification, which is known as also a type 2 C type. And it could be mixed causes as well. So when we get an instant restenosis and it's calcified, how do we go about treating it? Well, we first of all need to ascertain the underlying cause for the instant restenosis. And here, imaging is so, so valuable. And only when we are sure about what the underlying cause is, how severe it is, can we treat it properly. So if it's a calcified instant restenosis, obviously, first of all, we have to identify it and then do a proper job of preparing the lesion. So how do we go about preparing the lesion? We could use high-pressure NC balloons and short balloons, we should go up to very high pressures. Sometimes we can use two balloons together or a body wire together. The opium balloon can be effective. We can also use special balloons like scoring balloons, angiosculpt, cutting balloons. And for severely calcified vessels, we might need some debulking device like rotational atherectomy. In certain situations, intravascular lithotripsy can be used. And if you have a recurrent history of suffering from instant restenosis, then the better option might be, if required, to go for CABG. And for deciding what modality of treatment to use, intravascular imaging will be invaluable. 
So once we've prepared the lesion properly by debulking, what do we do next? We obviously have to scaffold that. So for scaffolding, we need drug eluding stents. But if we think that no, the lesion is absolutely instant, there's no peristent restenosis, then we can also opt for a drug eluding balloon, which really works. Especially if already the patient has two layers of stent, then a drug eluding balloon would be really effective. The other option might be brachytherapy, which is not widely available, or a bypass surgery. Drug coated balloons are now in vogue, and I'm really one of a great, I'm a great fan of drug coated balloons, and they can work wonders, especially if it's a instant restenosis, focal instant restenosis. If you have multiple layers of stent already and you don't want to add another layer of stent there, in case of major side branches and in case of a well expanded stent, and we've already seen great work about drug coated balloon from our previous speaker. And so the guidelines tell us that we need to use either a drug-coated balloon or a drug-eluding stent after proper preparation of the lesion, and here imaging can really help us. But if it's a stent strut fra fracture, or if it's already we've used multiple ISR episodes we have, then we should opt for a bypass surgery. So just to briefly go through some calcified uh, lesions, first, this is the history of a 60 four-year-old gentleman, hypertensive and diabetic, who was having severe chest pain for a very long time, and his echo was ejection fraction 54%. He had a history of undergoing PCI with drug-coated uh, stents 12 years back. So this is how his lesions look. You can appreciate that there is, so he had had a stent put from left main to LAD 12 years back, and now we see that there's a 90 to 95 percent instant restenosis involving that stent, as well as the origin of the LAD, as well as the origin of the LCX. So this is a first generation drug eluding stent. 12 years down the road, it is uh, instant restenosis. The RCA stent is still patent, but there was a stent uh, in the PD as well, which has occluded. So how did we treat this patient? So first of all, we took an EBU 3.5 uh, guide catheter. Uh, we wired both the vessels with uh, run-through floppy wire. And then we wanted to look, uh, have a look about with the intravascular ultrasound, but our intravascular ultrasound, we could not pass it because of the severity of the instant restenosis. So we proceeded to do a balloon dilatation. We took a 2.5 by 12 millimeter balloon, an NC balloon, and we went up to very high pressure. At this point of time, we could take our IVERS and we could see that there was heavy calcification in the site of the instant restenosis. So we did further aggressive uh, instant pre-dilatation. Uh, we took a 3 by 10 NC balloon. Uh, this was a scoring balloon now. We then took a 3.5 by 12 millimeter NC balloon. And for this, we went up to 24 atmosphere. So you really have to prepare your lesion well before you attempt to do anything to put another stand there. We did the pre-dilatation of the origin of the LCX as well, and for this we went, used an NC balloon and went up to 20 atmospheric pressure. We then proceeded uh, to do the steps of the DK crush because the le uh, the stenosis in the LCX required stenting. We felt so we placed a 2.75 by 18 drug eluding stent in the LCX and a 3.5 by 12 millimeter NC balloon from left main to LAD. We deployed our stent in the LCX. We then subsequently crushed our LCX stent after removing the wire and the balloon. We rewired the LCX, did our first kiss. We took our a drug eluding stent, a 3.5 by 18 millimeter drug eluding stent, positioned it from the ostia of the left main. So this was a second generation stent now. We deployed our stent, did proximal optimization, rewired, our st uh, rewired the left main to LCX. We then proceeded to do our final case, did report. And this was the final result. And you can appreciate that the stent struts are very well opposed. There's no under expansion. And the vessel looked angiographically fine as well. 
So this next case, this is a 77-year-old male. He had a bypass in 2000. He had been given grafts SVG to LAD, SVG to Ramus and PDA. A check angiogram was done in 2010 because of progressively worsening angina, and they found that the SVG to LAD was still pretend. The SVG uh, to Ramus and SVG to PDA had occluded. So at, in 2010, a cipher stent was deployed in the native vessel left main to Ramus, and he did quite well. And again, in uh, October of 2020, uh, he had chest pain, Angiogram was done in another center, and they found that the SVG to LAD was still patent. However, there was ISR in the left main to ramus vessel. A PCI was attempted in that center, but they could not dilate that heavily calcified ISR. So this is how his vessels look. You can see the native vessel, uh, left main to ramus, is there the stent has the ISR, and it's calcified. Other grafts are occluded. However, his SVG to LAD is still going strong even 20 years down the road, and hats off to the surgeons who did this. So now we have to treat uh, this uh, vessel, and this was done in the previous uh, center where you could see that there is dog boning effect. They could not open this vessel. So this is how the vessel looked. Uh, when we did his angiogram, and you can appreciate the calcification and the ISR in the first generation cipher stent. So what we did here, we did rotablation with a 1.5 millimeter burr. After rotablation, this is how the vessel looked. We did pre-dilatation with a 3.5 by 6 millimeter NC balloon. So as I had already said, a very short balloon, and you go up to very high pressure. After that, we took a 3 by 26 third generation drug eluding stent, deployed it, did post dilatation, did proximal optimization with a 4 by 8 millimeter NC balloon, and this was the final result. Now, this uh, last case is a very long story. Again, a uh, elderly lady, 75-year-old lady, hypertensive diabetic with chronic kidney disease, and she uh, had a PCI done with bare metal stents in 2004 to LAD and RCA. Bypass was done in 2008, uh, Lima to LAD, SVG to OM, SVG to PDA. Again, PCI had to be done to the SVG to PDA in 2014. And now she presented with progressively worsening angina. She was hospitalized with non-STEMI. And so we did a check angiogram, and we found that the SVG to OM and PDA grafts are occluded. The lima to distal part of LAD graft is patent. However, the apex region of the LV is there in the LAD has diffusely diseased. So this is, the LCX is totally occluded. The LAD is of a small caliber vessel with 90 to 95 percent lesion, very diffusely diseased. The lima, as I have alluded, uh, you can see that it, there's a graft, but it, the distal to the graft, the vessel is very narrow caliber and very diffusely diseased. So practically, she doesn't have any very good vessels. The RC is calcified, 99% ISR with diffuse disease. You remember she had a bare metal stent in 2004, and then she had her bypass in 2008. So there, there is an early arising PDA, and you can appreciate the angle that it arises. And this also has a severe stenosis, and wiring this PDA will be a challenge, we know. But first of all, we have to tackle the ISR and the heavily calcified RCA. Now, she doesn't have any good uh, vessels, as you can appreciate, so doing this was a bit of a challenge. So we first did rota uh, from, of the entire length, it's diffusely diseased, entire length of the RCA, including the bare metal stent. And uh, first we did with 1.25, then with 1.5, we had to step it up. Now, after uh, rotablation, the, we can see the PLV well, but that very badly angulated PDA, we've managed to lose it. And once that vessel got lost, our patient became unstable, and we had to give her a bit of CPR and all. After this, we uh, managed to open up this PDA uh, with the Conquest Pro wire. 
with the help of a microcatheter. Once we had opened this ve vessel, we were back in business, and now we knew that we had to go for a double stent technique here. And what we did is we knew that we could not afford to lose the wire in the PDA branch. So we decided that we would do upfront double stent technique here, a DK crush, and we would use the RCA to the PDA as our main vessel. So with this in mind, uh, we uh, took a balloon from RCA to PDA, and we took our stent, a 2.5 uh, by 48 from DES from RCA to PLV. We did our PCI, we used DK crush technique, and this was the final result. So I'll, I've cut down the steps because of, and you, you can see that the RCA is very well visualized, and this is the final result. And here, uh, this, the thing that you see there, that's a rat pad, and whenever we do complex cases, we you always use a rat pad, an extra protection uh, from radiation for us, and that works very well. So this patient is doing well, touch wood, till now, and here we would not have been able to get this kind of results if we had not used the rota. In conclusion, in very complex calcified ISR cases, we need certain devices like rota ablation, IVL, scoring balloons, etc., uh, for proper lesion preparation. And the treatment options may be a drug coated balloon or a new generation drug coated stent. If it's multiple times, go f we might opt for CABG. And coronary imaging definitely helps us to ascertain what kind of treatment we need and what tools to use. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Malik, for your outstanding presentation. Dear audience, you can ask question from Madam. What is your strategy? Direct rotablator or uh, in some cases you have already tried to Cutting balloon, scoring balloon. No, of like course. This. I mean, I'm it, sorry. It Here we sh just showed three cases. In the vast majority of ISRs, if the ISR is not that bad, you can get away with a good job just by using a NC balloon. Even go up to very high pressures. You can use a scoring balloon, a cutting balloon. Uh, these are like the topic was calcified ISR. So in calcified ISR, very long standing, we had to use rota in some cases, but rota is not a very common thing that we would use in ISR. We've got other tools to use in a, a ISR. So that is not cost, a I am telling the considering hmm? the if we face this type of case, can we consider the uh, scoring balloon, cutting balloon cost to reduce the cost? Absolutely. Uh, for uh, uh, most of our cases, we opt for a scoring balloon. It's not very expensive. It's easier to use uh, compared to a cutting balloon. And if a scoring balloon is not doing your job, you can definitely go for a cutting balloon. Can I, I have a short comment. Uh, you, you clearly gave two very important messages, Professor Fazila, which I totally agree with. The first one is to understand the cause for instantaneous stenosis, which is crucial, because these are frequent flyer patients. If it comes once, if you don't go with the right uh, therapy immediately, the patients will come back again. So understand it with imaging, and then be as aggressive as you can with the lesion preparation before final treatment. In instantaneous stenosis, uh, in my opinion, final treatment is less important than understanding this, and uh, preparing correctly the lesion. I have a very, this is just a comment. I have a, a, a small question, but you already went through it. Uh, in not very highly calcific instant stenosis, how is your experience with new generation scoring balloon? Do you use it a lot, uh, or you prefer using a semi-compliant, non-compliant balloon, or go to ha other treatments? No, thank you. That was a great comment. And actually, we in our cath lab, Ashok will agree, we work in the same hospital. We use a lot of scoring balloon. And scoring balloons are such a godsend, right? I mean, they do wonders. They're easy to use, not that expensive. So we use a lot of scoring balloons. So uh, that is very important. Recently, we are using a lot of scoring balloon, even not only ISS, but in calcified and fibrotic lesion. The difference between the uh, scoring balloon and the cutting balloon is, cutting balloon is on time use. You cannot go very high pressure that will rupture. Trackability is less. In very tight lesion or in difficult situation, mid LED or distal RC, it is difficult, difficult to deliver up to that lesion. A scoring balloon is more deliverable. 
it is in our cons uh, uh, that is on our uh, concern is reusability reusability is very uh, good and very high pressure 24 28 we used to go with a scoring balloon having a very good result and someone may tell that body wire uh, works like a scoring balloon that is not true because wire is polymer coated there is some coating over the wire so it is slippery but the scoring balloon the wire that is used in a different manner and that is a sharp very sharp and that cutting capacity is much much higher than the normal uh, ptc wire thank you man uh, can i can i um add on uh, um, Professor Omol's uh, uh, the cost of using the things. I think, you know, poor man's cutting balloon is also we can do with uh, just simply with another wire, which we used to do. So before. that, madam, I was talking. Yeah. I, I have gone through that wire that is used here. Yeah. That, that is the different wire. That is very sharp. And the uh, body wire that you use, that is very uh, smooth and slippery. So that can, uh, cannot cut the wall like that of a scoring no, no, balloon. You are, uh, you are right. I was going to say that not always you are successful with that, but um, if it is uh, not that old and uh, not very um, fibrosed, then probably you will get away with it. Uh, about two weeks ago I did that because I didn't have anything in my lab, but I couldn't even take the patient down and he would not get down. He said, yeah, whatever you want to do, you do it, I'm not getting down. So f first I did balloon at a, uh, high pressure, it worked a little bit, then I, I did a cutting balloon, size was not there. So at the end I had to do this. And it was not easy, it took long time, but ultimately we could do it. Then after that, we again did the uh, balloon inflation and then it was okay. But it's very difficult and it's uh, not, you are uh, uh, so sure you cannot be 100% that it will work for you, but it is an alternative. <laughs> one, should, one should know it, if it works, it works. Uh, one yeah. small comment, uh, I think on this buddy wire, in fact, uh, uh, I would show in the next uh, meet, in the next uh, symposium, uh, we have used two body wires. In fact, three wires are put on one, we had the balloon and on, there were two additional body wires and that opened up uh, a region which was undilatable by any means. So, uh, and this has been described in the literature. So by now we have used it in three patients out of which we were successful in two. We could not uh, achieve the success in the third patient. So two body wires. So, right. uh, have you got any idea, the body wire is there, balloon is inflated, that trap the body wire and pulling, pushing of the body wire, that, is it helpful to cut the uh, lesion, no, you, keeping uh, the catheter very much uh, stable? No, you don't have to push the body wire and that may not help, it is only the balloon is already there deflated, you put two wires by the side of it, yes. now you inflate, so it acts like a scoring balloon, okay. it acts like a scoring balloon. Thank you sir. So thank you, Madam, for nice deliberation. So our last speaker is Professor S. M. Mustafa Jaman. Uh, he is the professor, uh, University Cardiac Center, BSMMU, and he will be talk on update of 2021 SCC AHA guideline on coronary artery revascularization. Cardiologist perspective of left pain and multivessel uh, multi disease. Left pain, multivessel uh, disease. 2021 guideline. Respected chairpersons, panelists, uh, friends, colleagues, and national and international faculties. Assalamu alaikum. Now we'll present uh, my topic of 2021 SCCHA guideline for coronary revascularization and cardiologist perspective of late men and multifacial disease. Actually, uh, I must salute uh, our cardiologists and uh, cardiac surgeons, clinical cardiologists. Uh, who are actually developing the treatment facilities of the world. And I must salute our senior colleagues and senior teachers in Bangladesh also, and uh, especially today's guideline. Who were involved in this guideline, I must salute. And my topic will see the cardiologist's perspective of late main and multifacial disease. It is very difficult to say something in favor of interventional cardiologists, especially in favor of uh, this guideline, because our, this guideline maximum area actually in favor of cabbage. So I'll say something uh, some, uh, this against this guideline maybe, but not against the guideline, I will say something, my interest in this field, 
and uh, I must respect everybody because our surgeons is here, senior surgeons. So I will say something. Every, every our my sentence for the people and for the patients, how we can manage the patients. So late main and multifacet is always challenging, especially for uh, managing the patients. So especially uh, heart team management, I will say I already discussed. So lesion severity is very important. We know the coronary physiology class one indication, especially for intermediate lesion and class three also uh, in case sometimes and I was also to a lesion and syntax score, score uh, very, very important, but uh, uh, it is also discussed and coronary angiography, especially we always, we, everybody knows that, uh, more than 70% uh, and more than 50% for late main. But in intermediate lesion, we have many things and uh, sometimes it is very difficult to identify or clarify the length of the lesion and how to we target the complex lesion and it is very difficult sometimes which is simple and which is complex i can understand i can understand something sometimes actually so i don't know during procedure this planning this uh, guideline they have used this newer technology or strategy of pci and uh, this type of ffr they have used or not I was how many cases they have used this case during this process, planning this uh, guideline. It, it now, uh, because few minutes back, our Sufya Madam mentioning that some during uh, processing the guideline, sometimes we have assessed the countries or uh, global perspective. Sometimes we have no health insurance or many many things we have actually planned and discussed before preparing this guideline. So I will say something because hard time, hard team is very important because. Uh, especially for late main and multivessel disease, uh, it is very difficult to sometimes say which is better. Even sometimes let the patient choose because we have no health insurance in our country. And heart team is actually, this concept is come, come out in the world after the syntax trial, which was introduced or published in 2000, 2009. So, and uh, Dr. D.S. Gambir mentions uh, half an hour back that is syntax uh, trial also long term. Uh, trial. So I will say something. And the uh, late main disease and multiple disease, the debatable sometimes uh, PCI, which is better, PCI or CABS. And this is a long term debate before the publication, publishing of this guideline is still now going on. I hope long, long after the 10 years or 20 years, 50 years, this debate will be running on. And uh, I, I, always I think, uh, I, I, all the heart team is not the same everywhere. Even inter-hospital heart team is not the same. Sometimes, if in some hospital, you can see the clinician with this, uh, is the, take the upper hand. In some hospital, the interventional cardiologist take the upper hand, and sometimes the surgeons may take the upper hand. So heart team is, is a, always not the same. So, but I must respect everybody who are contributing their thinking uh, this uh, type, improving the patient's quality. And again, I mentioned that, that these, when this uh, guideline is prepared, they have mentioned only the patient's survival. Already a few minutes back, Dr. Our senior as surgeons already mentioned uh, that the patient's survival. But the improve other things, actually, they have not discussed or the thinking before the uh, pre preparing this guideline. So, especially uh, class one indication PCA versus CBG in patients with complex disease. Again, I mentioned complex means the thrombotic lesion, severe tortuosity, heavy calcification, complex bifurcation, trifurcation, autoastial stenosis. So everything has actually considered, is considered as a complex, but other than this criteria, a lot of patients we have. So how we can deal the patients? In patients who require revasculation for significant late main coronary disease with high complexity, already mentioned, it is recommended to choose to CABS over PCI to improve survival. Again, I mentioned to improve survival, but only survival is not the, our attempt. We have a lot of things to give the patients quality, symptom free, even more, less the morbid, morbidity, mortality, a lot of things. And class 2A, in patients who require revascularization for multivessel coronary disease with complex or diffuse coronary disease, the synthesis score more than 33. It is reasonable to choose CABS for PCI 
only uh, to confer a survival advantage. Uh, we know that uh, cabbage is gold standard treatment and CA PCI is only palliative treatment. But we are doing a lot of PCI in different complex disease, especially multivessel disease PCI. Even in this uh, conference, you, have, you will see the lot of topic and even life case, all are doing this type of complex and multiple disease with the PCI. But uh, surgeons are always friend, not the four, but we'll discuss how to improve and how to improve this guideline uh, in our regional context. PCA versus CABG in patients with complex disease, especially diabetes, our most of the patients have with the diabetes, but all the diabetes is not same. Diabetes, multivessel disease, appropriate candidate for cabbage, we know, but cabbage with Lima to LRD, recommended class one indication. In this guideline, you will ne see never single one indication, uh, especially for PCI, all are favor in favor of cabbage maximum. And class 2A indication, 2B, 2A, 2B indication. PCA can be useful in diabetes who have multivessel CAD and are poor candidates for surgery. And PCA may be considered to reduce major adverse cardiac output in diabetes with late main stenosis and low and intermediate complexity of coronary artery disease. A lot of uh, study trials already you have, uh, already Dr. D.S. a few minutes back uh, mentioned the syntax trial. Uh, this is a good study and long term, and uh, already CABES was superior to PC with lower rates of major adverse cardiovascular uh, events. The benefit was primarily driven uh, by a significant decrease in only repeat reverse stern rates, but everything was similar only for repeat reverse. So you can do the PCI, the patient may be need again PCI, that is, but there is no other any mortality or other uh, indicator any difference. So only repeat reverse section. And noble, and you can, you can see the almost no difference was found between cabbage and PCI, respectively for all cause mortality and stroke. And Excel also very good, good uh, trial. And so that lot of passion involved in this uh, study. And here, synthesis scored less than 32, especially for late main stenosis, lower intermediate. And the primary outcome showed non-inferiority no, uh, actually for the comp uh, composite of death from any cause, stroke, and MI at three years. At five years, no significant difference was seen between PC and CABS for the composite outcome of death, stroke, or MI. Reverse question trials of Letman disease CABS versus PCI. Uh, Meta-analysis, uh, you have seen four clinical trials comparing the PCI versus CABS for Letman stenosis, Excel, Novel, Recombat, and Syntex. And comparable outcomes are for both and re for both revascularization strategies in patients with low to intermediate complexity, but more repeat revascularization. Again, I mentioned after PCI and another meta-analysis, uh, same the Excel Nobel. I uh, will see the uh, no significant difference in both composite endpoint of death, stroke, and MI. So, the with along this guideline, I am showing this type of uh, meta-analysis for the sharing of knowledge. Uh, how we can improve in our regional context for the patients, we can do, do better management. And ESC 2018 guideline, there is class one indication. ESC guideline recommends CABS for late meniscinosis for all syntax score uh, group class one and PCA for late meniscinosis recommended for patients with a low syntax score less than 22 class one. But in this guideline, I have again mentioned there is no Class one indication in this scenario for the uh, late, uh, late main or multivessel disease. PCA for late main stenosis in patients with an intermediate syntax score can be performed 2A also. So, percutaneous coronary uh, intervention with drug glutic stent versus coronary artery bypass grafting in late main coronary artery disease and individual patient data analysis. The Lancet published this study and uh, conclusion was that patient undergoing revascularization for late main coronary disease, five-year mortality does not differ substantially between contemporary PC and CABS, while key secondary outcomes, including spontaneous MI and repeat revascular, are less likely with CABS. Uh, you'll see the uh, one is angio. This is 81 years patient. This is primary PC I've, did, I've done just last week. If, right. Uh, Conversion was totally occluded, and that was 
and the left side was badly diseased. Actually, I did the uh, primary PCI at that patient, but my question actually after the primary PCI, how will manage the patients with multiple disease with the left side? So there may be heart team also they are also and heart team also recommend maybe medical treatment because patients is uh, 81 years how maybe surgery but uh, most of the time the heart team will decide, decide and let the patient choose again because patient 81 years the after chest pain when the, uh, the yeah uh, when the chest pain disappeared now patient was very good how will we will manage the patient in next time so 81 years i will share the knowledge with my learning audience learned audience so stme with we'll see esteem with multivessel disease especially by patients without significant comor comorbidities with large non infarct vessels this is very very important especially in this scenario suppose in hemodynamically stable patients with stme in this scenario multivessel disease after successful primary pci in this case stage pci of a significant non infarct artery stenosis is recommended class 1 and low complexity multivessel disease PCI of a non infarct artery stenosis may be considered at time of primary PCI to reduce cardiac events. Class 2B. And in STME, in selected patients with complex multivessel non infarct artery disease after successful primary PCI, elective CABG is reasonable. And uh, this is class 3 harmful, I will not discuss, complicated by cardiogenic shock, so I will not discuss in here. So, this is primary PCA, this patient's uh, right CA, and next uh, discussing already. Now, non-STMI, this is very conflicting and sometimes very difficult to identify the culprit lesion, especially recommended timing of invasive strategy in non stay elevation SES, and uh, immediate invasive strategy may be done, early invasive strategy within 24 hours, plus 2A, Invasive strategy with, with uh, intent to perform reverse before hospital discharge, uh, initially established patient. So actually, reverse in this context of non stcs should consider clinical stability, risk of recurrent events, coronary anatomy, and degree of myocardium risk. But sometimes it is very difficult to identify the culprit vessel as like as ST elevation MI. We can, uh, we can identify the culprit lesion, but it, sometimes it is difficult to identify in this scenario. Special, should we perform a complete reverse collision in patients presenting with non stcs and multivessel disease? So in high risk patients presenting with non stcs coronary angiography should be performed as soon as possible within 24 hours from hospital admission. And already uh, it is reasonable to consider physiology guided reverse collision of non culprit lesion in patients with non stcs with multivessel disease. This is hard, not uh, this is guideline. And the stable ischemic heart is very, very conflicting. Uh, I know uh, yesterday our Fazila madam also mentioned this uh, during when he, she is presenting his case. So this is another conflicting actually, especially in guideline. This is very, very important. I am showing the guideline, this uh, 2021 guideline. So class one indication you will see if refractory angina, uh, anatomic indication and indication of improvement, we will see the guideline uh, class 1 indication and in the right side you said if no refractory angina so I'll, I'll mention only the same thing uh, press this area cabbage and PCA will see in you especially for patients with low heart failure uh, low ejection fraction we can uh, recognize the cabbage but our few cardiology, uh, cardiac surgeons actually do this uh, patients surgery if, if uh, F is less than 35 and heart team sometimes very difficult to say which is better sometimes they send the patient only medical management so guideline therapy we can discuss and uh, our time is actually very uh, little so i will skip some sir. Uh, one or single vessel again uh, uh, according to the proximal led uh, very uh, already class 3 indication i will not mention and uh, Reversal approach to reduce cardiovascular events, stable coronary heart disease to be, and I will say post CABG patients. We'll see the post CABG patient, especially, sorry, uh, two slides I'll say. This is post CABG patient.
So, you see the right side, only we can do something. Otherwise, uh, we have nothing, passion or symptom. So, what should we do according to guideline? So, I'll discuss. And time is very limited. Again, uh, we'll see the one study, one case says uh, coronary angiogram, inappropriate graft replacement. Just within the uh, stent, over the stent, the graft was actually implanted. But uh, we know our surgeons, few minutes back, he mentioned that should be grafted in the healthy area. So again, I mentioned that PCA versus CABG is a, still now is a good debate. And um, uh, always we know surgery is a gold standard treatment, but sometimes we do PCA also. We are doing this, but there is no class one indication for PCI uh, in this guideline. So moderate benefit, we should consider quality of life, milestone of percutaneous technology development, lack of trial with a newer PCA technology outcome or need more trial to make a conclusion. Assessment of ischemic burden is very important. It is highly variable always. So surgical audit should be done, but in our country, not everywhere. We have never seen this any surgical audit uh, and surgical risk calculation should be done also. And two goals of therapy, especially uh, that should be considered, already mentioned, and age of the patient should be considered. And use of graft in CABG, that is very important for arterial, venous, and uh, newer imaging, so that is not discussed in this guideline. For that reason, I am actually incorporate this, this few sentence. So decision should be individualized in some cases. So always let the patient choose again. A lot of unanswered th uh, actually question and answered in this guideline. So due to time, I will not discuss. Uh, but a lot in this guideline, a lot of things uh, that is confirmed and some unanswered question, uh, question mark they have uh, mentioned in this guideline. Due to time, I am skipping all the things. And yes, the guideline, they have mentioned a lot of things in this class one indication you have mentioned, but in this guideline, there is no class one indication in favoring PCI. Your time is over. Yes, yes. Now, last slide, Walls on size does not fit all. All nerves are not same, all eggplants are not same, all diabetes mellitus, multivessel or late main, all cabbage or PCA are not same. So, lot of debate is still now going on, cabbage versus PCI, end of the debate. This is New England Journal in 2020, and the treatment of late main disease, let the patient choose. This is 2020-21, so still now debate going on after publishing this guideline also. So thank you. This is our dream. So this breeze we can use to fill up the gap, the real scenario with the guideline. So we, are, we hope we can conclude the session, especially in our regional context, we can publish the guideline for our patients. And that this, the newer guideline should be corrected, especially our patient should be patient friendly and cardiologist friendly. Thank you. Thank you for first passion sharing. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa Jaman, for nice deliberation. Uh, so, dear audience, any question from uh, this topic? Regarding heart team approach, uh, I'd like to ask one question to Professor Bernardo. What is your experience in your center regarding the heart team approach? Because that is not so much practice in our country. Some center used to do the regular heart team approach, but many center, uh, we are not used it commonly. Uh, very rarely we are using it. What is your experience and comment regarding heart team approach? Uh, well, if you are asking me, my experience, it is a little bit different to other centers, okay. to other Italian centers, because our center is devoted to complex interventions. So uh, we don't have a cardiac surgeon on site, so we decide always uh, when to treat the patients or not. Uh, and we, we have a good relations with the surgeon, okay, because uh, this is the only way to, do, to go now. Um, but given that uh, we are using uh, not so many stents, but uh, therapies like drug coated balloon, which is more uh, um, uh, preserving the integrity and the anatomy of the vessel, we use a lot of imaging, we have very low complications. So that said, I would say that 96-97% uh, of the coronary artery patients are managed by ourselves. In specific cases, when we feel the surgery is better, we send the patient along. Thank you, sir. So, uh, uh, a small comment from I'd like to ask, uh, I'd like to request Professor Odin Maski for uh, his comment. 
and then I like to uh, request Professor uh, Brigadier General uh, Alia Sultana to give her concluding uh, remarks. Yeah, I mean, what we are talking is uh, guideline directed therapy. So, whenever you decide in your center, you need to know who is the best. If you have a best surgeons, yes, you'll be referring patients, but your interventionists are very good. Then you'll be doing more of a complex lesion. So, what guideline says is this is good for centers where are the uh, interventionists and surgeons are best. But you'll have to decide. Like many places, you don't have good surgeons. I mean, they are coming up. So it depends on what you decide is what is best for the center at your center. So that's very important message everybody should take home. Learned audience, good afternoon. We ha much has been discussed today and we all are highly delighted by all the presenters. They're nicely present and we are de delighted by their enriched presentation. Uh, PCI versus CABG. There is lots of controversy and lots of debate are going on throughout the world and it will be going on in future also. But the, so many newer things are coming that the ISR is a great challenge not only for the operators is as well as for the patient. Acute ISR, late ISR, so it is leading cause of death in some times. So nowadays, you have seen that they have mentioned in their presentation the drug coating balloon and also IVL. It's a sore rewarding. They will, it creates a great hope in our future and our future endeavors. But limited study and trial is going on regarding drug coating balloon and also IVL. I think we have to go a long way and future we will be landed in a safe zone. Thank you all for the, thank you very much for the patient hearing.